Hi, and uh, welcome to our talk where we are going to be answering the age-old question, what can go wrong when you trust absolutely nobody, um, aka threat modeling zero trust. Uh, my name is James Callahan. I work as a security architect for Control Plane, and I'm here with my esteemed colleague, uh, Rick. Uh, morning, everybody. My name is Rick Featherstone. Um, as you can tell, uh, we're, we are twins. Um, so I'm, I'm the head of engineering at Control Plane. We're a cloud native security consultancy. Um, we're, we're hiring at the moment, so if you want to work on cool, pro uh, cool problems with cool people, come and have a chat with us. If you've got cool problems that you need solving, come and have a chat with us. And uh, I'll hand back to James. Uh, but yeah, thank you for joining us this morning. Cheers, Rick. And uh, like I says, uh, we are a booth uh, SU57, and we'll be here uh, around for, for the rest of the day. So yes, please, please do come talk to us. Uh, we're all uh, friendly and uh, look, would love to chat. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, this is a um, kind of a narrative talk. We're going to take you on a journey. Uh, first of all, we're going to start off by trying to understand together what uh, zero trust means. Um, it can be a bit of a buzzword. So we're going to understand, uh, starting from a threat modeling perspective, um, once we have uh, developed our um, zero trust uh, philosophy, we're going to use this to build a high level architecture. Uh, once we have a high level architecture, we're going to create a, a, a detailed threat model, uh, dive into the details and iterate on our controls. Um, we are going to prototype this, so uh, there is a public repo uh, which you can uh, clone and spin up yourselves. Uh, the message is, uh, we'll send you the, uh, give you the link um, at the end. Um, but the message is really prototype early um, to understand um, how the components of your system fit together uh, so you can think like an attacker. Um, this talk will focus on zero trust for workload, workload communications. Uh, worth mentioning that we're not going to touch on kind of uh, zero trust in the supply chain because that's probably a whole suite of talks uh, just, just on its own. Um, so yes. Um, what is threat modeling then? Um, we all threat model all the time intuitively. Um, so when I went to a piano bar last night and the pianist uh, started playing Rick Astley, uh, I had to make the decision, do I join in or not? Um, and I thought the risk of me not having a voice today was too great. Uh, so I did a little threat model. Uh, I, I de de derived a control, which was don't sing, you idiot. Um, and uh, everything was good. Um, but if we do this in our personal lives, why would we not do this uh, with our IT systems? Um, so threat modeling um, systems is all about identifying and enumerating threats and vulnerabilities, formalizing this in terms of a risk management framework and escalating risks as part of that framework once they've been quantified. Threat modeling gives us loads of benefits. So we identify security flaws early. Uh, we save time and money by doing this. Um, we understand complex risks, um, which we couldn't understand otherwise. And the key message that we want to get across is that everyone should threat model is not just something for security teams. Really, the people who should be threat modeling um, are the people who have developed features, engineers, uh, developers, uh, who understand code the best, because they can put themselves in the position of an attacker uh, the easiest. So threat modeling is an iterative process uh, following this four question um, uh, timeline. First of all, we ask, what are we building? Uh, we draw architecture diagrams, data flow diagrams. Uh, we understand um, uh, at a high level and at a detailed level uh, what our system looks like. Once we have this, we ask what can go wrong. This is where we put ourselves in the position of an attacker, uh, think up nefarious scenarios, uh, and try and brainstorm these using techniques such as stride and attack trees, which we'll do for our example system uh, in a few slides' time. Once we've done this, we need to devise mitigating controls. That's the next step. We need to uh, minimize our residual risks. And then finally, um, threat model Threat modeling is iterative. Um, we need to be constantly asking, are we doing a good job? Are our controls effective? Uh, do we have effective automated tests uh, which um, tell us whether our controls are working? So let's start to make sense of zero trust via a very, very, very high threat model. Uh, so this is a very simple diagram. Uh, we've got a user interacting with a workload, two workloads communicating. Uh, one workload uh, persisting data to storage and interacting with persisted data, and another workload uh, calling uh, cloud provider APIs. Um, there's two keys to uh, deriving zero trust principles from this diagram. Uh, the first is that we're not specifying anything about these workloads. Uh, they could be running anywhere. Um, workload one could be running on a Kubernetes uh, EKS cluster, for example. Uh, workload two could be running on a VM uh, on-prem. So we're not specifying anything. The next key, is to define our trust boundaries. 
So I'm sure lots of you have heard um, people say things like, well, workload one and workload two are within our um, protected network. Therefore, of course, they can communicate by default. Uh, we say no, uh, that is not the way to think about things. Shrink your trust boundaries down as small as possible and never trust, always verify. So we're going to threat model using stride. Uh, so can I spoof any communications? Can I pretend to be someone or something uh, which I am not? Yeah. Um, can I tamper with information flows and, uh, and compromise the system that way? Um, repudiation, uh, can I do something and then say, I didn't do it, uh, Bart Simpson style? Um, information disclosure, uh, can I exfiltrate data uh, to um, uh, parties who should not be privy to that data? Uh, denial of service, can I take the system down? Um, it's going to be very important when we're talking about workload identity that we have a highly available uh, mechanism for distributing those identities. Um, and finally, can I escalate my privilege and do something I should not be able to do? So let's derive our high-level architectural principles from this very simple threat model. A really easy way to do this is draw a table. Threats down the left, high-level architectural controls on the right. So we'll go through this line by line. Um, so spoofing, first of all, user impersonation. Like I said, we're focusing on workloads in this talk, so we won't go into too much of the cool stuff you can do uh, in the zero trust space around users. We're focusing on workloads. However, um, we, we need to be cognizant of the, the, the controls there, so um, user authentication and authorization best practices and establishing uh, provenance of, 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 of our users. Workload spoofing, however, is where we come to our first um, kind of topic for the talk. So this means if we want to do this well, we need the concept of a cryptographically um, verifiable workload identity. Uh, and we're going to use um, a technology called uh, Spiffy, well, a framework called Spiffy, and the production-ready uh, implementation of the, the Spiffy workload identity framework called Spire. Uh, we'll, we'll show this in the, in the prototype later on, uh, when Rick will give a demo. Um, workload spoofing as well, we want strong integrity protection on the client side and the server side of any communication, so um, we're going to use MTLS. We're going to make things easy for ourselves by using uh, Istio Service Mesh uh, for our two workloads in our example prototype. MTLS obviously helps us with tampering risks as well, altering uh, information in transit, maybe not so much the, uh, uh, the mutual part, but the, uh, uh, the, the encryption part. I, I, I guess the, um, the integrity checks as well. Um, we could tamper with stored data. Um, so this is where we need strong authorization policies everywhere. And you can see another high-level control later on is policy as version code. Policies always link back to organizational business requirements. Uh, therefore, um, we, we need to be able to keep track of who owns a policy. How do I make a change to a policy? And the way to do this well is policy as version code. Uh, you can hear some good talks by Chris, ne Chris Nesbitt-Smith on this uh, exact topic. Um, so repudiation risks, um, this is where we want to uh, tie um, cryptographically strong identities back to things which workloads are doing. So we maintain audit logs. When it comes to policy, um, our demo is going to use a general purpose policy engine, um, open policy agent. Uh, so this control will up be all about maintaining uh, um, decision logs and making sure that those decision logs can't be tampered with. Exfiltrating data would be an example of uh, information disclosure. So again, it comes back to policy. In, in this case, egress control uh, and, and, and network policies. Preventing workloads from communicating. This could be a denial of service risk. If we're using Spire and I, as an attacker, can take the Spire server down, how are um, uh, workloads going to get their, their identities? We need to build something highly available. Um, our demo later will be not a uh, production-ready demo, so this would be further work that we would have to do, and we would get that work done by doing more detailed threat models of those sorts of denial-of-service attacks that could take place. And finally, uh, a compromised workload could pivot. So workload one may not be able to uh, hit uh, a, a specific endpoint, um, and um, least privilege authorization policies, again, are the way to enact this. So now we've got our high level principles, it's over to Rick to uh, build an architecture. Cool, thank you, James. Okay, so I'm gonna try and uh, satiate your uh, desire to see diagrams and code and, uh, and demos without drawing too far away from the fact that this is a, a talk primarily about threat modeling. So uh, in our fictitious example here, um, we've got workloads. What kind of uh, requirements have we got? Where um, we've got a, an external facing uh, service, we want to make sure that we're, uh, uh, we're using TLS to expose that service. Where we've got services communicating, we want to use mutual TLS. Um, so we need to be 
uh, distributing keys, certificates, and trust bundles so we can verify those. Um, both of the workloads on here are going to be uh, accessing various AWS services, um, and so they need to get uh, temporary AWS credentials, um, and they're going to be able to do that um, using Web Identity Federation, so taking a, a, a JWT, a JOT, uh, and using SDS to exchange that for temporary AWS credentials um, mapped to IAM roles that grant them access to, to the things that they need to, to do. So on the left there, um, we've got a very simple service. Um, uh, it's going to be making direct uh, API calls. So at, at the bottom there is, is Spire. I'm not going to go, I'm going to kind of keep it kind of high level, but if you think of Spire um, as your identity vending machine, um, so you can get your, uh, your X509 uh, identity documents or your JOT identity documents from Spire. The good thing about it is that the workloads don't need to know uh, anything about their identity. They can be a bit amnesiac. Um, kind of go, hey, who am I? And Spire will go, oh, you are service uh, uh, X. Um, so on the left there, uh, it's going to get uh, an X509 certificate that it can use uh, to expose uh, the API uh, over TLS, uh, and it's going to get a JOT uh, and exchange that for, for uh, AWS credentials and get access to, to the S3 bucket to download, a, uh, to retrieve a file and then present that to, to the user. Um, and in that, in that example, we're kind of, because we're using the client APIs, we're, we're writing all of that. So if we move over to the other side, we're moving to the service, service mesh uh, type approach. So we can kind of remove some of that coding complexity uh, from the developers there. Um, we've got Istio service mesh there. Uh, Istio can uh, retrieve its X509 material from Spire using the uh, secret discovery service. So we've got that plugged in. Um, to the right of Istio, we've just got a sidecar there. Now that's periodically um, getting the, the job from Spire, writing that to a shared volume so that the uh, OPA sidecar um, can get temporary AWS credentials to download the bundles um, from the S3 bucket um, and make the, the policy decisions. So if you can think of uh, uh, OPA in this case as basically a yes, no engine. Can I do this? Yes, no. Um, we could do um, some of the authorization decisions just with Istio itself. Uh, OPA gives us a bit more kind of flexibility. Um, it allows us to uh, make external calls to bring in uh, additional data and things like that. Um, keep, keep that in the back of your mind because we'll come back to that in a sec because that's a bit important. Um, and then uh, we've got, uh, so, so we've got Istio, we've got OPA, we've got uh, Aspire, we've got Kubernetes. We're, and just to make sure that we get our talks uh, um, approved, uh, accepted, we're going to get as many CNCF tools as we can. So we're going to use uh, Caverno over there to uh, inject the sidecars into our workloads. So that's, uh, that's our example uh, architecture. Uh, and as James mentioned, what we want to do is we want to be prototyping early. Why do we want to do that? Um, so it helps us understand how the technologies that we're, that we're using work, how they integrate with each other, think about what can go wrong. Um, as James mentioned, we're going to open source the repo uh, and make it available for you to kick the tires and play around with this. Um, and so in order to do that, we want it to be uh, simple and reasonably cheap and fast to, to spin up. So instead of using um, a managed cloud provider Kubernetes cluster, um, we're just going to use uh, a local kind cluster uh, and just some S3 buckets. Um, the, uh, the, the offside of that is that for the OAC discovery stuff, um, in order for uh, AWS to, to um, verify the jots, uh, it needs to be able to access um, the discovery document and the key set to verify the jots. Um, and normally, uh, if you're running in a public Kubernetes cluster, you would expose an OIDC discovery service uh, publicly like that. In order to make the demo work, um, we're just going to use an S3 bucket and we're going to ship the discovery document uh, and the keys uh, up there to get that working. So let's, uh, let's have a quick check just on the example on the left-hand side and make sure it works. Now, this is not a given. Um, it's been working fine uh, all week. Came in this morning, uh, went to deploy stuff. And uh, at some point yesterday, AWS made a change to the, uh, uh, the default policies on S3 buckets. You, can, they are, uh, you cannot make them uh, pr public by default. Um, and they've removed the uh, access control list. So as I sat there, I'll just check this works before we go for the demo. And error, 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 all panic stations. Um, so uh, can, I, can, can you all cross your fingers for me? No, seriously. <laughs> Okay, so let's deploy example one. So remember, this is just uh, a simple uh, a simple web service exposing 
uh, an API, a rate CPS, it's going to get a file from an S3 bucket and serve that back to the, uh, to the users. There's the, uh, the little warning that they sent out in December that at some point in April, um, probably the day before you do your uh, presentation at KubeCon EU, we will, we will break things for you. Um, so, uh, looking good so far. So, uh, all right, so now uh, it's not just, why is this not working? Huh? Oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now that's a relief. Can I, can I get a woo? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, that's working. I'll get a woo and a phew. Uh, um, uh, yeah, let's just uh, quickly have a quick look at the, because uh, I know you want to see some code. Oh. Let's uh, shrink that up. So the, uh, the, the Spire client libraries have, uh, have got some kind of useful stuff in there. Um, so we're going to create an X509 source here um, and then use their TLS server config. So we just drop that into the server there uh, and then we'll, we'll run up the server and it'll get its X509 certificates directly from Spire there. Um, create a jot source and then pass that into our flare handler. Um, and this will um, it'll, uh, create an AWS configuration. And then we've got a custom uh, credentials provider here where we're passing in the JOT source uh, and exchanging that for uh, temporary credentials to create an S3 client, which allows us to uh, download the object from the bucket and serve it up to our, uh, to our calling. And um, We can see that it's been issued from our Spire server. And resolution is awful. And there we go. In the uh, URI SAN, we can see it's uh, using the Spiffy protocol. We can see it's using the control plane, uh, trust domain, and we've issued this workload identity to our S3 consumer. Quite normally. Um, so um, now we have our uh, detailed uh, architecture and a prototype. Uh, we can draw data flow diagrams. So data flow diagrams are um, essential to help us threat model. Uh, what we will do is, is kind of like apply stride, like we did to the high level one, uh, to uh, each individual uh, uh, communication. Uh, but now we can look at these uh, network communications in uh, a great deal uh, more detail. Um, so much. Uh, detail, in fact, that uh, the diagram doesn't fit nicely on a slide. Uh, so don't pay much attention to the to the nonsense. Um, uh, the, the GIF is just there to show kind of um, our, our, our generic workflow. So we've got a user at the top uh, coming through ingress. Uh, if we follow the purple line down, uh, we'll see the user is, uh, we've got the Spire stuff uh, in the middle. Um, the user is hitting a workload uh, via the workload's Envoy proxy. Um, a decision is being made uh, by OPA, and this also applies to the workload workload communications. We see the workloads are pulling uh, OPA policy from uh, the policy management plane. In our case, it's just uh, the policy is hosted in an S3 bucket. And then the workload is calling out uh, to um, a cloud provider API, uh, just as a, uh, well, bo both, uh, both RICs um, have just, uh, just shown us. Um, so now we have our data flow diagram. Let's start threat modeling the detail. Um, a really good way to do this is by drawing attack trees. And uh, Kelly Shortridge uh, has shown us how to do this. Um, there's a really cool um, app called Deciduous uh, where you can make these yourself. Uh, we are just going to use Graphviz uh, kind of under the hood uh, and draw some pretty basic trees. Uh, we're going to use this key where um, green nodes are ors, uh, blue is and, 
uh, the grey ones are kind of just single nodes which uh, which kind of end. There's no uh, logic uh, underpinning it there. And reds are out of scope. So things like, uh, like we said, zero trust supply chain things out of scope for us today. So let's build an example tree. Uh, we're going to walk through a path of the tree and just focus on one risk and show how we would build a control and iterate the control. Uh, so let's start with a bad outcome. An attack tree always starts with um, something bad that the attacker wants to do. Um, this will always come down to uh, an attacker wanting to compromise one of the three um, unholy uh, trinity uh, properties of cybersecurity, confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Uh, so let's take a confidentiality example where what our attacker wants to do is leak sensitive data. We're not specifying what this data is, they just want to exfiltrate um, sensitive data. So you can leak data either by sniffing traffic in transit, exfiltrating data, green node, so it's an or. We can think of a number of ways to do this. We're just going to focus on exfiltrating data. So, like Rick said, um, you might want to use OPA, you might want to use this um, sidecar model with OPA. Uh, if, um, let, let, why wouldn't we just use uh, Istio uh, standard authorization policies, for example? Well, maybe we have really complex decisions to make where we want to pull in external data and make uh, authorization decisions based on that external data. Uh, so in that case, OPA will have access to a data bundle. Um, so why don't we just try spitting out data uh, from, from the OPA container itself? Why don't we try and exfiltrate data via um, HTTP calls from the OPA container to an attacker control service and exfiltrate data from our database? What would an attacker need to be able to carry this out? They would need a, an outbound path uh, available to them. So this is a blue node, so it's an and. Um, and they also would need to be able to um, deliberately misconfigure the policy uh, to spit out data in this way. What would they need to be able to uh, deliberately misconfigure the policy? Uh, they would either need to be able to change the code, uh, so they would need to uh, steal, um, or, uh, yeah, get un unauthorized access to the policy repo, uh, somehow merge their code. Um, we, we can imagine quite a few controls in, the, in that space, so let's think about another way they could do it. Um, they might just have misconfigured write access to um, the bundle storage location. In, in this case, it's just an S3 bucket. Why would they have write access to this? Um, they, they, of course, shouldn't. We have a control in place here, which is um, IAM and um, the principle of least privilege. Uh, only the policy pipeline should be able to write to that um, storage location. However, um, we never want to be one um, misconfiguration away from catastrophe. Uh, maybe uh, something is wrong with the pipeline, maybe something is going drastically wrong with our system, we need to make an emergency change, and someone gets emergency access, write access, to, to just write a, an updated policy. We never want to be one misconfiguration away from disaster. That, that's the message. What we do with our tree is we do this lots more times and, and, and draw a kind of a, a decision tree. Um, and it would look something like this. So we, we've walked one path of that. The details here aren't important. You can again look at this in our, in our repo. We're not going to go through other branches of this tree today just to show you that the real tree here will be way bigger than this. So what will we do about it? Now it's time to design our controls. We'll take a, a simple table-based approach like we did before. We're going to write our uh, more detailed confidentiality, uh, uh, confidentiality threats on the left now and write our more detailed controls on the right. Again, let's not go through this line by line uh, because you can see this in, um, in our repo and in, in our, our PDF. We're going to just focus on that one um, uh, walk through the, the, the attack tree that we did before. So if we look at the bottom um, uh, threat on this table, overwrite policy bundle, uh, like we said, we've got two uh, key controls here, uh, cloud provider RBAC, least privilege, and, and, and you can audit as well, so automated audits and things. Um, maybe that's a separate control, but um, um, here we just have it as one. Um, and then you see C14, uh, policy bundle signing and verification. Um, instead of just relying on um, our, our IAM uh, configurations being correct, uh, let's add an additional control and say that um, our uh, policy pipeline uh, should have access to a signing key. And um, OPA should only be able to load signed bundles which have been signed by this key. Uh, so here we have um, defense in depth. Um, 
Worth saying that we, uh, when building custom controls, um, some controls will need further architectural work. So if we did look into the details on that bigger attack tree before, we would have seen a threat which is compromised Spire uh, data store. Um, if I could do this, maybe I could add in uh, fake uh, uh, registration entries and um, uh, convince one workload that uh, I am an, uh, a legitimate workload uh, that should be able to talk to it, but in reality, I'm a, a malicious workload. Um, however, to, to threat model this in detail, we need to make uh, design decisions about uh, how Spire is going to uh, access this, um, this stored data. Uh, so what we would do at this point is draw a lower level attack tree and, and do a detailed threat model. So going back to our example attack path, malicious internal actor uh, exploiting misconfigured IAM to overwrite uh, the policy bundle. We have a control but we have not yet uh, talked about the implementation. Um, how are we gonna do this? Are we gonna use uh, default tools available to us? Or is our risk profile a little bit more um, cautious um, and we want to be uh, additionally secure and design a custom control? And this is where I hand it back to uh, Rick. Okay, so, so, so this is the final architecture. And as we kind of mentioned, we want to threat model prototype and threat model again and, and keep iterating around this. So, so as James mentioned, um, we don't want people to be messing with the, with, with the bundles. Uh, so where we start is we go, right, well, OPA allows us to sign these bundles. So the bundle publishing pipeline can have access to a uh, private key, it can sign the bundle, um, and then the, uh, the OPA sidecars can have access to a, a, a public key and they can verify the signatures. And we know that those bundles are, uh, uh, are good uh, and nobody's uh, um, messed with the integrity of those. Um, so I did that and said, right, great, I'm, I'm, I'm done now, James. And James said, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Now you've got a, now you've got a key distribution problem. You've got to be passing this, this, this private, private key around safely. You've got to make sure you're passing the public key around. How often are you going to update those? Um, so, um, so he points out that you can create your own uh, a custom uh, signing procedure. Um, and he goes, can you do that? And I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. The narrator, he can't do that. <laughs> so where, where do you even start? So great thing is in the uh, OPA contrib repo there, there is um, an example here. So it's basically the framework is all there um, for everything you need to do to create your own custom, uh, uh, custom build of, of OPA with your own uh, signer and verifier in there. But they didn't do it for you. Um, so uh, what does the signature even look like? So we have a look on, uh, 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 on, on the OPA site there. Uh, where's the? So the signatures. Uh, what is the signature? Uh, um, ah, it's a jot. Oh, that's handy. I know about those from the identity side of things. Um, so it's just uh, oh, it's just a jot in a in a in an array of signatures. Um, so you've got the standard uh, key ID. Uh, the the the, uh, the algorithm that's used for the for the encryption there, uh, and then the payload itself um, is just a list of files in the bundle, um, uh, and then a digest and the algorithm that was used to, to do the digest. I reckon, I reckon it might be all right now. I can uh, I can probably pull this one off. So, uh, and we're just we're just implementing uh, interfaces. So, how does that look there? So signing it, um, it's going to create a new bundle signature with the, uh, the algorithm, the key ID that comes in in this configuration here. Um, and then with the list of files that, that's provided for the bundle. Um, create, a, um, create the message to sign. So that's the, uh, the header, base64 URL encoded, the payload, base64 URL encoded. Drawing with the dot, uh, then we'll sign that, base64 URL encode the signature, stick another dot in, bundle that all up together. Chuck it out, jobs are good. Um, for the verify itself, similar kind of thing. Um, we get the signature coming in. Uh, we'll parse it, um, figure out what, the, what key was used to sign it, um, and then uh, verify it, and pass back the list of files. So then uh, we verify the signature, the list of files that are in that, that signature there, pass that back, and open knows everything's good. Um, so that wasn't, uh, that wasn't as hard as I thought. So let's uh, simulate the uh, bundle publishing. Uh, uh, 
bundle publishing pipeline. Uh, and you can see uh, just using the alias for, for KMS key there, um, signing that um, and pushing the bundle to S3. Pop back to here. So, so basically, we've just introduced uh, AWS KMS keys for, for the signing there. Um, so the open sidecar already had a, uh, a token could get uh, AWS credentials to exchange that to get access to the bucket. Um, so now the, the bundle publishing pipeline needs access to the uh, to the key for the sign operation, um, and Oprah itself needs access to the uh, to the verify operation. So let's drop back into the uh, the risky land. Of, uh, demos. So just just deployed a couple of workloads talking to each other. Let's check that. Awesome. So Istio is getting the X59 certificates um, from uh, from Spire there. So we're uh, looking at reasonably good. So we're just going to send. So we've got a couple of workloads. We've got some open policies uh, allowing access on some your uh, on, on some endpoints and, and and not on others. So we'll just send some requests through, and we can see that uh, Oprah is allowing and and, and denying requests uh, based on the policies there. So uh, that leaves us in a reasonable space. Um, I think. Um, so yeah, the. Uh, uh, the demo is going to be made available. Uh, bear in mind that uh, there's still a little bit of work to do on it this, this morning based on uh, AWS's fantastic uh, changes uh, at some point yesterday. But uh, thank you for that. James, you want to wrap up? Thank you. Yep, we, we do have a summary, but uh, we, we can go straight to questions. Just to, to really quickly summarize, even well-architected systems can, can use threat modeling. Uh, Threat landscapes change, technologies change. Um, keep threat modeling and do it iteratively. Um, obviously, with uh, in, in today's world, zero trust is more crucial than, uh, by day by day. Um, we've shown you Spire. We've shown you Istio external authorization. We've shown you Open. We've shown you some tools that you can use. Uh, and we've shown how custom controls uh, can be made as well. So the last step in uh, the threat modeling process, like I said, is did we do a good job? We don't have time to discuss this today. Uh, but you can give us feedback uh, by, by scanning the QR. Um, uh, so yep, yeah, thank you. And any questions? Okay, well, um, we, we, like we said, booth uh, SU57. If you want to talk uh, more detail, we'll hang around for a bit now. Uh, just, uh, yeah, let us know if you want to chat. Thanks for coming and thanks for your support.